Clayton, hanging with my man, he's just so fly. Oh yeah, and welcome to episode 5 of Throwback Hoops. Woody V is in the house. You just heard me in my amazing voice singing N Vogue's intro to Hanging with Mr. Cooper. That's because, as always, I'm hanging with Mr. Clayton, and he is so fly. What's good, my main man? Yeah, what's up, Woods? Uh, mate, I love the singing. You might have to do that every week for me now, but I'm not sure if the audience will like it. But yeah, great to be back, mate. Thanks, brother. Thanks, brother. We also have a very special guest on the show today. He's an ex-professional basketball player, co-host of Oz Hoopers TV, head basketball coach at Sydney Grammar School, director and founder of Grind Over Everything. He's also a trained physiotherapist. There's nothing this man can't do. He's my lifelong friend and like a younger brother to me, Mahesh Padmanabhan. So good to have you on the show, my little homie. Thanks for taking the time. A pleasure, man. Obviously, we, we've been in touch over the years and always talking hoops brings us together and seeing what you guys are doing. And, and it's, it's a privilege to be here. Hopefully, we can get into some, some dope content today. Yeah, we're happy to have you here, Mahesh. So just before we get into it, guys, I just wanted to do some housekeeping. So if you want to tune into our video show, you can you can catch us on YouTube. If you want to listen to the audio version of the show, we're on all podcast channels, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts. Please hit the subscribe button and leave us a review. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Can you believe it? Nearly 1,500 views and downloads over the last two weeks alone, Robbie. That's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, really appreciate everyone's support, and we're just loving coming back. It's, um, yeah, we've been looking forward to do this one all week, I think, haven't we, mate? Yeah, definitely, definitely, we have been. So this week, we've got a huge show for you. We have some classic throwback jerseys to showcase, as always. We'll touch on the controversial NBA uh, Top 75. We'll have Robbie's favorite segment of our show, Hawk Stock, and we'll finish our NBL team previews with the, with the Melbourne teams. And of course, we will have a, a great discussion with Mahesh, our special guest today. So let's get into it, shall we, boys? Let's do it. Let's do it. So Mahesh, uh, why don't you tell the audience a little bit about our relationship growing up, you and I, and how we are connected? Yeah, for sure, man. Oh, um, yeah, so what do you mean you go back? since birth i guess is the, is the is the way to put it our yeah, man. parents have been friends our grandparents have been friends so obviously grew up in a in the south indian community together so we're, we're tied closely in, in that regard and i guess growing up like you said you know you were kind of like an older brother to me we used to hang out a lot our, our parents used to get together on weekends to hang out go to the local park and, and play some hoops not that i was i was any good back then but i'd Always try hard. I remember that. Yeah, and I, yeah. I dunked on you, right? Remember yeah, that? Right, yeah. You used to teach me a few things. I remember. In the backyard, yeah. I remember one time we were at your house and you playing on this nine-foot rim on the brick wall next to the staircase. Threw it off the off the wall, had me spinning around. I turned around and you just got up with this huge two-hander. Rubbing Man, this in is... and, and talking. I, was, I would have been eight at the time, I reckon. I was this, about to say, this... I bet he let you know about that as well. Huh? I did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, this is a case of like, you know, the... The, the student becoming way, way better than the teacher, man. You know what I'm saying, Rob? Yeah, you know? nah, but I mean, those are good times, man. Like, obviously, like I said, it goes, the basketball is just a just a, a passion that we both both share, but the relationship goes deeper than that. Obviously, we've been close for a number of years, and even if we don't speak for a while, I know that you know, I can just pick up the phone and, and you're always going to be there. So it's Love is always there, Hesh. Love course. is always there, man. Both ways, right? So I guess, um, Mahesh, you know, you're affectionately referred to as Coach Hesh in the basketball community. So we're going to run with Hesh or Coach Hesh today. You good with that? Yep, either or, man. Yeah, Coach Hesh has just been, I guess it's something that's easy to, easy to kind of say, but yeah, I'm happy with either. You got it, man. So, you know, when, you, when you're a guest on Throwback Hoops, you got to wear a jersey, right? Mm -hmm. Right? So, you know, being a guest today on our show, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about the jersey you're wearing? Well, first of all, why don't you get up and, and, and show the show the audience and uh the the jersey you're wearing but the, for those who can't the see brooklyn nets number 11. kyrie yeah. irving jersey that's there that's the, the first Hesh. time i've seen that jersey won all season there we go that that the kyrie irving i mean embarrassingly enough i i don't own a nba jersey of my own and i'm sure i'm going to hear about it um but that being said i i actually reached out to, to somebody i was coaching today and asked for a, a spare jersey and had the Kyrie Irving one, and I thought, yeah, yeah, that's probably appropriate given given how much Kyrie Irving's been in the media recently. Um, and I'm a big fan of Kyrie Irving, to be honest, and his game. So it's definitely a jersey I'm, I'm happy to rep. And while you got that on, Hesh, why don't you tell us a little bit about the Irving situation right now? Will he be back playing 
anytime soon for for Brooklyn. Oh, that's deep in the basketball there. It's out of my out of my kind of depths. I don't know, man. It, that touches on health, touches on politics, touches on yeah. It's it's a far reaching kind of concept that that's yeah. I don't know. Who knows? I hope so. I hope we can see him because I think we're missing out on a, a, one of the greatest ball handlers and skilled players of any generation of all time. Nice. All time. So, so, fair call. I hope fair so. Call. I hope so. I mean, who knows what situation how it will unfold? But he seems pretty stoic and he's pretty prideful. So mm. you know, it might just be one of those situations that we'll have to wait and see. Yep, agreed. So, Robbie, why don't we move on to you, my friend? Sure, mate. So I got the double jerseys as always. Um, so look, I'll start with the one hanging up. Um, it's a pretty retro South Dragons Joe Ingalls jersey. Um, so look, probably a lot of people don't, um, you know, might not remember Joe from his time in the NBL. So um, Joe basically played uh, all three seasons that the South Dragons were in existence. Um, he was actually their first ever um, contracted player. Um, he was rookie of the year in his first season, and he led them to um, a championship um, in two thousand and eight. 2008-2009. Um, unfortunately for the Dragons, a couple of months after that championship win, they actually folded due to financial circumstances. Yep. So it is a bit of a random jersey. When I was actually looking today, Woods, I actually had a Matty Burston one as well, but I thought the um, thought the Joe Ingalls one might be a little bit I've more I've seen popular. that one. Yeah, it's a good <laughs> yeah. one, right? So, and look, I guess the one I'm wearing, um, obviously we're matching today. We're, we do have uh, different players, but yeah, I'll sort of, obviously this guy doesn't need much introduction, but I'll, I'll show you what I'm rocking anyway. So for those who, who can't see, Robbie's wearing the classic mid-90s Andrew Gaze Melbourne Tigers jersey, pointing at a picture of Andrew Gaze signed in the back there. As you see, I've got that signed shoe behind me as well from Gazy Woods. We've had that yeah, one a while. But, seen um, that in your place, man. Yeah. yeah, I mean, look, Andrew Gaze, I mean, I don't really need to, to tell everyone too much about that. I mean, I was just sort of looking at some of his accolades today, and it even surprised me, to be honest. Um, just very quickly, um, just in case anyone doesn't believe he's the Australian GOAT, seven-time MVP. 14-time scoring champ, five-time Olympian, two-time NBL champ, and a 15-time All-NBL first team, which that was probably the one that blew me away more than any. So, um, yeah, Andrew Gay is an absolute legend. Um, happy to be rocking this jersey today. Yeah, it's a great one, Rob. And I just thought if you're going to be wearing that, then I might as well wear this one. So just let me stand up for a second here. So Woody's standing up. He's rocking the Leonard Copeland Melbourne Tigers jersey. That's a beauty, that one. It uh, looks pretty similar to the one I'm wearing. I like that one there, Woods. I should be throwing you some alley-oops or something if we're wearing this combo. Hell yeah, man. Look, when I when LC came here in 1992, I was just in awe. You know, I just started watching the game three years ago prior in, in 1989. And, you know, back then on ABC, you were lucky to get one NBA game a week, Robbie, right? That's right. Um, yeah. And we didn't get that many Perth games televised in Sydney, so I didn't get to see heaps of the Alabama slammer James Crawford. Uh, we did see a lot of Tigers game, and man, Copeland was like no one I'd ever seen in this country before, right? You know, six foot seven swing man, played above the rim, could score from outside, get to the mid range. He was an excitement machine. And, and when we talk about the great deals in the NBA, Malone and Stockton, Kareem and Magic, Scotty, Michael, you know, my brother and I try to be Gaze and Copeland in the backyard <laughs> on that very ring that I dunked on you, Mahesh, right? <laughs> the greatest duo in NBA history, no doubt, right, boys? They really were. I mean, I think they sort of got on so well together. They're kind of like a modern day comparison would maybe be like when, you know, Kyle Lowry and DeMar DeRozan were, were playing together and they were pr practically best mates off the court. So, yeah, they just had such a good understanding um, together and just complemented each other really well. Yeah, obviously yeah, I, I hear I hear about the, obviously I hear about it from you guys and guys of your generation. How long were they a duo for? Like how many years did they play together? Could be at least I 10, right, Woods? 10, 92 to 2001, man. Yeah. I think then, then Leonard went into Adelaide for a few years, yeah. uh, Brisbane for a few Brisbane years before finished. finishing off at Adelaide. Yeah. And I don't know if you remember, uh, Hesh, uh, about 13 years ago, uh, Leonard Copeland played one of his last games at West Sydney against the West Sydney Razorbacks in that stadium. And you and me are actually at that game. I remember you came with me on a Wednesday night or something, right? right. And we were watching that game. It was one of Leonard's very last games playing with the West Sydney Razorbacks. You were actually there, right? Many years back now with me. Remember that season we went to most Razorback games together? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. That's yeah, so, I wouldn't have even placed the two together if you haven't mentioned it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and actually, um, they, as you said, they still remain like the best of friends. They coach together at the Sydney Kings, right, Rob? Yep. And then... You heard him on the microphone like last oh, year great, commentating together. It was just amazing. Yeah. I, I hope to see that again this year. But um, I guess like, you know, it's only fitting today that we're showcasing three of the greatest throwback jerseys in Melbourne basketball history when we're doing our Melbourne team previews. Right, boys? 
Exactly right, mate. I mean, I did tell you today, I did have a Mitch Creek jersey somewhere. I couldn't find it, but, you know, it's all good. I just thought I'd rock some retro ones more than the modern ones. But, yeah, good to go for these Melbourne previews today. We've got a, we've got a lot to talk about with those. And just to add to that, Kyrie Irving is born in Melbourne as well. Oh, mate. <laughs> there, you go, there you go. Perfect. There you go. You too. To Dredrick. Dredrick, isn't it? That's his father's Dredrick name? Irving. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Dredrick Irving, yeah. Who, where did he play for? Coburg, I think it was, Rob. Is that right? From memory? I'm not 100%, but yeah, yeah, we'll go with that. Yeah. yeah uh, so, Hesh, I'm going to kick it off with you, my man. You ready to chop it up with Robbie and I? Yes, sir. All right. So, let, let's start talking a little bit about your pro basketball career, right? You spent the best part of four seasons in the Indian Basketball League for the Hyderabad Sky. Now, a lot of people would not even know there's a league in India. So, so tell us, how did that come about? Yeah, for sure. So, basketball in India is is interesting. And Woods, I don't know if you'd be you'd be aware of it, but it's still a kind of fresh sport. And they're trying to... The infrastructure is just so limited over there. You know, it's still an outdoor sport in most kind of senior competitions. It's played outdoors on concrete. Like there's not many gyms in India. So, you know, just infrastructure limits how much they can grow the sport. But basically an American company came in, uh, a, a few guys from Phoenix, and they came in and they saw a, a space in the market to, to start a league. And um, I got in touch with them through another tournament I was playing in at the time in Malaysia. And I was, I was trying to traveling Asia at the time, doing a, doing a few little local tournaments and things and trying to just pave my way up, up the ranks of playing some level, high level basketball. And then I, played against an Indian team and I got in touch with a few of them and they were shocked that I was from Australia, but I could speak Tamil and you know what I mean? Like we bonded over that. So I just got in touch with them when I saw some social media content of the Indian league. And I just said, how do I get into this? And they just put me in touch with some people and then flew over there and, you know, just, just signed for, for, for a few seasons and back to back seasons I was playing there. So it's kind of how it went. And then, then obviously with everything in India, the politics came into it and then people, right. People weren't getting paid and then the league kind of went, went south and they had to disband it all and you know the, the bfi the basketball federation of india was basically not getting any profit from this league so they banned a bunch of players from representing india if they would ever play in this league and the legal disputes are apparently still going on so uh, that that's kind of where, where it ended and then that's when i came back and i ended up training with the the illawarra hawks for a season um and then after that i kind of called it quits and started coaching i guess I was interested, Hesh, with the, I guess, in India there. Is the NBA very popular there? Is that something that's sort of grown over the years or is that sort of still a little bit sort of, you know, away from sort of their main sports over there? I, I think it's it's always going to be tough. And Wood's going to attest to this. Cricket is religion over there, you know. Yeah. Like it's tough to break in, in into the mainstream market, but it's definitely grown. I probably liken it to, to China of the early 2000s where mm-hmm. you have a billion people with an untapped market of, that, that don't understand probably the most – exciting end-to-end sport in the world you know anyone can watch a basketball game and be entertained so it's obviously a, a very um yeah it's a very i guess a good situation and opportunity for the nba to come in so they've started the nba academy over there in, in delhi yeah. um and they've um built a few stadiums and they've done a few things to try and infiltrate the market there but but it's still a, a work in progress and i think it'll take some time before it really takes off um but yeah they, they're starting to get in there and it's starting to get a little bit more popular now cool yeah, I mean, I, even Adam Silver went and sat with the IPL bodies to see what they, what they were doing. They're two, you know, massive, massive leagues, you know, that, that have so much revenue and money going through them. So the model is there. It's obviously getting the, you know, the, the traction for, for another sport other than cricket in that market, which is difficult, right? Yeah, so. and I think the biggest limitation is infrastructure. I can't emphasize yeah. it enough, man. I lived there for, for the best part of three to four years. And just the, the craziness to think that most of our games and training sessions were you know, sometimes we were expected to train on concrete and it's just nowhere in the world is that the case. You know, you go to any other country and it's indoor gyms and it's yeah. hardwood and it's, it was just crazy. And then, so I think that that in itself is a, is a huge limitation. And Woods, you know, you've been to India many times. You know what it's yeah. like, man, to get know, man. done and to, to actually make inroads into those things takes time and you have to have the right people in, in making decisions and, and putting the money in the right places. So I hope I hope we can see India play in the Olympics at some stage. That would be something that would be, that'd be cool to see, you know. Yeah, Robbie really loved Amrit Pal Singh when he's here with the Kings, didn't he? Yeah. yeah. Where did he end up going? He just sort of didn't hang so around. Did he? India. he played with the league that I was playing in. Mm. Big guy. He, he tried to get some <laughs> NBA hype around him. Um, didn't really, wasn't too successful with that. But um, yeah, he, he went back to India. And then most of them just realized that, you know, because they're not taught things from a young age. They might be talented. Like Amrit Pal is a great example. He's got great hands. He's mobile for his size. Big seven footer. 
but he's never been taught concepts. Doesn't know how to guard a ball screen. Doesn't know how to communicate on help defense. Doesn't know anything. And then he just gets exposed at that higher level. Um, and then that kind of limits him. And then he just kind of ends up going back home and, and working with his dad's village or whatever it might be, you know. So hopefully they develop the pathways and having a viable professional league. And if the NBA can get involved in that, then, you know, like like Woody said, similar to the IPL model, they can, they can make some moves. How is your Tamil anyway? Not that good. Come on, man. Dude, it's pretty good, man. What are you talking about? <laughs> I'm trying to live there. I'm trying to live there. <laughs> Better than me, man. Yeah, I speak pretty good Tamil, man. I spoke to your grandma the other day at the at the clinic, man. I'm having a good conversation in Tamil. Man. <laughs> awesome. Well, that's a, that's that's a good segue there. I mean, you're very highly educated. You got a couple of degrees and are a qualified physio. I know. I know you're still practicing. You treated my grandmother the other day at the physio. Yeah. So you made that decision many many years ago to transition into a career in basketball. You know, it's just awesome. You're doing what what you love. And I'm so proud of what you've achieved. In our community, it's all about, you know, education, do this, be a doctor, etc. But you're like, you know, screw that. I'm going to do what I want to do and make myself happy. So what what does, what made you make that decision and, and, and make that transition? Yeah, I mean, I guess it wasn't a momentary decision as such where you just go, oh, screw yep. this, I'm going to do this. It just kind of, I did I did the necessary, like, you know, the, the education. Like, I, I couldn't have gone out of it, you know, we're, we're kind of, uh, brainwashed is a harsh term. Obviously, it comes from a good place, and our generation yeah. of parents just think like that. Where it's you know, you go to school, you go to uni, you get a degree, you work for forty years, you have a family, and you retire. You know, that's, that's a great life. And I guess I'm I'm blessing or a curse, however you put it. I guess I'm brought up in a different environment, different generation, where I'm, I guess I have a bit more autonomy and independence to make decisions. Maybe it comes from a little bit of privilege as well, but given the fact my parents yeah. worked so hard and given me an education and the, the ability to to access so many resources to be able to do that. So by no means is it just me. Obviously, I've, I've been I've been blessed enough to have opportunities to do things. But I think I've always been someone that's that's followed my heart with things, whether that be in my personal life or professional life. If something doesn't feel right, I don't do it. If it feels right, I do it. And and coaching has always been something that's felt right. Well, basketball, I should say, has always been something that's felt right. And then to add to that, I'm 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 a pretty insanely competitive person. I don't like coming up second best, and I don't like people telling me I can't do something. Uh, it tends to make me want to do it even more. So I put those two together and I ended up just kind of falling into a career in basketball whilst balancing the, you know, the, the I guess, obligations of, of getting going to uni and getting a couple of degrees and, and working when I needed to and, and doing the rest of that. So, you know, it's just one of those situations that I look back and go, well, wow, I guess I'm a, my full-time career is basketball and I wouldn't have it any other way. Yeah, really proud of you, man, you know, and what you're doing, so... Much respect, right? Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, all right. So, look, you've been head coach at the Sydney Grammar School now for, what, four years? Yeah, about four years. Yeah. So, I mean, how did that opportunity come about, Hesh? And, and have you enjoyed that? Lots of great players coming out of the Sydney private school system. Robbie was just telling me off air about uh, Agent 97 being an uh, ex-Barker alumni. So, mm-hmm. you know, just, just tell us a little bit about the system there, what you do and, and how that's been. Yeah, for sure. So um, I, I actually graduated from Sydney Grammar School um, in 2005. I spent my last three years of high school at Sydney Grammar. Um, so obviously within that private school system, it's, it's a big alumni culture. So getting back in touch with the school and looking for opportunities. I went back and coached volleyball initially um, when I first came out of high school, just as, as I was a uni student to make a bit of extra cash. And as my coaching career started kicking off and I started doing things, I got in touch with the, I went away from grammar for, for, you know, a good five, seven years. And I got in touch with the director and yep. I said, listen, I'm a, I'm a coach. I want to learn how to coach this and that started off in the, in the, with the 15 G's or whatever it is, you know, one of those teams that was teaching yep. people how to chess pass and how to dribble their left hand and stuff like that. And then ended up helping out with the first grade team. And then the director was looking for someone to take over the first grade team because his, his hands were full with a lot of other administrative tasks. He just told me, he said, listen, you seem good enough. How would you like it? And I took it with, without a hesitation. And four years in now, I love it. It's, it's probably my, my highest level of kind of team coaching at the moment. I do a lot of player development. So being yep. involved in the team environment where I get to plan and periodize the schedule and, and put together concepts and a culture and be involved on the team standpoint is, is fun. Um, and, and I'm really enjoying it, like lacking the learning curve as well. So, you know, don't plan on stopping that anytime soon. I, I love being involved there. Hey, Hash, I'll be interested to know, mate. I know we had a quick chat yesterday and I was telling you about my love for uh, Hubie Brown, um, NBA veteran coach there. But just yeah. wanted to know if there were sort of any coaches out there that, you know, you sort of, you know, you admire or you've sort of, you know, sort of, 
like you know been inspired by in the past, or sort of alternatively, if there's any coaches that you, you know you've maybe borrowed some moves or some you know some plays or anything like that off, off you know over the years. Yeah, that that's that's a pretty good question. I guess, like I said, I I try and kind of compartmentalize it into different sections. So I'm a I do player development, which is working with players individually, and there's a few kind of well-renowned trainers and, and player development coaches in America that I kind of pick their brains on and watch their MIT content and see how they, they do things and kind of use my own intuition with that as well. There's guys like Alex Basil. I don't know if you would have heard of these guys, but Alex Basil has this company called Through the Lens Basketball. He does a lot of work with Trey Young and Carmelo Anthony. He's involved in their skill development. And yep. so I watch him. Um, Chris Brickley, I'm sure you guys have heard of Chris Brickley. He's yep. one of the, the, the mainstream kind of trainers who infiltrated the hip hop scene as well. And he's a kind of mogul amongst basketball trainers. So from a player development standpoint, I like looking up to a couple of those guys and just seeing how they operate and how they move and trying to just pick and pick apart things. But, but to your question about plays and about team coaching styles, I mean, it's, it's one of those things that's, it's just like anything. I think if you want to be good at something, you, you pick away from other guys that have that have been proven to be amazing at it. So you you, you can't go wrong with, with any of the, the greats that you look at. Uh, I'm actually, I'm just borrowing Phil Jackson's book at the moment. I don't know if you guys have read it. Have any of you guys read that? I haven't read it, Robbie. Have you well, read what's it? What's it called again? I have read one. In the... I think it might be called 11 Rings or something like that. Yeah, yeah. no, no, I haven't read it. No, no. Yeah, so I'm, I'm looking forward to reading that. And that one's mm. all about, you know what Phil Jackson was like? He was different level of thought process and how we Speaking operate. of books, he used to give every player on the team a book yeah, to read in the off-season, didn't he? So. The, the Zen Master, right? The Zen Master, exactly. So I'm, yeah. trying, to, I'm trying to read Not that. Not sure what was in his pipe, though, but anyway. Yeah. yeah, but apparently he talks in depth about how to deal with um, difficult personalities and how to make a mesh and how to get the best out of people, and which, which, fair, which, oddly enough, is the bulk of team coaching. I mean, the X's and O's is if you understand basketball and you watch enough of basketball, you can learn that pretty comfortably. And if you have a natural yep. feel for it, pretty easy to draw up plays. And you can understand, like I've learned all my late game clock management from from NBA, just watching how they manage the last minute of a clock when they're down three or down four, two for ones and all these type of different things. So I haven't really learned that from coaches, but the main management side, that's something that I'm, I'm really learning from guys like Phil Jackson, who's done amazing. And Greg Popovich, who no matter what team the Spurs get given, they seem to be successful. Um, and even going outside of basketball, I'm very interested. I've been watching footy recently. Craig Bellamy from Melbourne, mm -hmm. someone that's a coach outside of that realm that I've been listening brilliant. to and, oh, and watching from. So yeah, I guess I mean you're yeah, interest. you're a point guard yourself. You know what I mean? Like yeah. you've, you've 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 played the position yourself a lot, right? So in terms of running the offense and drawing up plays and stuff, you know, something you're familiar with. But if you can take that man management, you know, how to you know manage different personalities from different different people also allows you to hone everything together to, to make yourself a great great coach with different aspects of the game, right? Yeah, that's right. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, terrific. Um, so th thanks, Hesh. I guess um, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a fan and a follower of your, you know, your podcast, All Hoopers TV. Tell us a little bit about your partner in crime there and what you're doing um, in that space, if you could. Yeah, that'd be great. Cool. So, so yeah. Reese Reese is his name, Reese, Reese Gannis. Shout out to Reese, who's, who's doing some big things with his brand. Oz Hoopers um, and hyping up the, the local talent, which we need. Remember when Ball Is Life came out and all those kind of companies in America to hype up the, the, the talent, high school mixtapes of players. Like he's doing a lot of that stuff for the younger generation and hyping up Australian talent, which I think we need because we've got a lot of it. Um, he just got in touch with me when um, he knew I coached a few of the kind of elite players down here in Sydney and he came to film a couple of guys and we just kind of got in touch through, through a workout he was filming and yeah, started talking and he said, listen, I'm about to do this podcast tomorrow night with Keeper Sykes. I don't have a co-host. Do you want to do it? And I said, yeah, for sure. I'll, I'll jump on that for sure. I'd love to chat to Keeper Sykes, pick his brain about some things. So that's how it started. And then we just started doing episodes after episodes and we've just kind of built it from there. And it's been fun. It's been good to, to chat to some of these NBL guys and, and NBA guys and coaches and different personalities within the game. So yeah, cool. we can keep that going. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, and check it out, guys. You know, it's on YouTube as well. So um definitely got some great guests on the show as well Hesh. so that's that's terrific as you mentioned Kiefer Sykes was your debut episode but since then there have been a lot of nice personalities come on the show right so yeah definitely look now I know you got your own thing happening with grind over everything um, and as I mentioned on our first episode guys whoever tuned into episode one you work closely with Diwali Bales um, and others like Agent 97 Jared Weeks and we mentioned a bit earlier and even Shyla Hill recently Tell us about what Grind Over Everything represents and your initiative. That would be great, you know, Hesh? 
yeah for sure i mean it's i guess it's just a personal coaching brand and i wanted to call it something that's it's always hard when you're coming up with a brand name like you know what i mean like you yep, put definitely. together yeah. and you go far out that's lame i'm not using that and I, I wrestled with this for a little while and i was like yeah maybe this will work and i like the initials how they look goe and so yeah i just kind of came up with it and thought listen i'll do my own thing start my own coaching brand I, I have a good relationship with a lot of players and i'm already working with some of the country's most elite kind of young players so i thought good opportunity to just start my own business with that and, and i guess that's where it kind of started represents more of a i like to work with um a certain demographic of player i guess underrated slept on players um that, that might not get their chance or might not get the help yep. that they think they deserve and you know we, we work at it to, to get them to where they need to go and, and that relationship building element of it is, is what i do it for like i love knowing that you know we're, we're both benefiting and we're on the same page and when we kick goals together it's like it's it's satisfying man and, and when you work i guess you, you got to have that job satisfaction with what you're doing so uh, at the moment it's, it's it's growing and i'm excited for, for what we're going to get into in the, in the time to come and especially with the talent in australia just being involved in that at a younger age and probably giving them some an opportunity to do things i personally didn't have the opportunity to do when i was 18 19 20 coming up learning the game and being in situations of how to be successful i got lucky because i was indian you know and i managed to to play for a couple of years but yep. some people might not know where to go and what to do and and, you know, trying to provide that opportunity and, and pathway is something that I'm passionate about. So that's where it kind of started. No, sorry. sorry. Yeah, so just um, we did have a viewer question, um, which was actually pretty topical this week with Hesh being on board. So um, mm. so I'll just read that out, um, Hesh. We had a, we wanted to thank um, our viewer, Shahan. Um, we know he's a big, um, I guess, watcher of the of the show there. So basically his, um, his email there for Coach Hesh, um, love the show. Always look forward to your new episode dropping, guys. My two-part question is, what were the circumstances that led to Shyla being waived in the WNBA? And secondly, you've been doing one-on-one -on -one workouts with Shyla recently. How did that go and how did it come about? So maybe we'll tackle that first part first, Hesh. You know, what were the circumstances that led to Shyla being waived in the WNBA? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I'm not going to proclaim to be heavily involved in the situation as such i guess like my relationship with shyla's only kind of met her this year and and i wasn't really involved in a journey to the WNBA, but we did kind of open up about it a little bit and talked about it and obviously it's been documented pretty well shane hill was pretty upset with how it all went down and yeah obviously it's not a great situation where you, where you go somewhere you think you're going to be a young and upcoming star you get drafted as as high as she did and then she got traded and then after being traded she got waived by the team she got traded to so pretty unpredictable t um, turn of events of how it all happened and you know it's just one of those things that, that remind us that that at that level it's a business at the end of the day and you know you're a commodity and if if a gm or the owners feel like you're not going to be used or from a financial standpoint or whatever standpoint it might be they can just you know get rid of you or, or the drop of a hat so and that's that's a harsh reminder of the reality you know we see the glamour and the gloss and Yep. See all of it but then sometimes it doesn't work out like this yeah, yeah. cutthroat is it yeah cutthroat man it's and she you know she was um she's she's a hard she, she's tough like she's mentally really tough really strong she's obviously exceptionally skilled so she'll be back there without a doubt you know she's 19 so she's got years to to fulfill that and she'll be she'll arguably go down i think as australia's best guard potentially ever like just in terms of her skill set and what she can do so i'm excited to see her back in the WNBA, and, and hopefully that's sooner rather than later so, like, I mean, you've been doing one-on-one -on -one workouts with her as well. So, um, you know, that second part of that question, you know, mm -hmm. like, how did that go? How did it come about? And um, you going to help her get back to the WNBA? Well, that's the plan. Um, she's she's under the pump at the moment with Sydney Uni Flames preseason. They're all kind of preseason at the moment with the NBA, NBL and the, and the WNBL. So they're kind of, I don't have my hands on them too much at all. Yep. Um, I'm, I'm all coming in the off season during the season a little bit when they have off weeks and lighter weeks but, sure. yep. but at this point in time it's been very limited with the amount of work that i've done done with shyla but the, yep. the times we have kind of linked up and talked about some things you know it's, it's been good and i've been excited to, to help her came about actually funnily enough i one of the other elite players in the country that i work with his name is hunter madden shout out to hunter he's doing some big things over in the american scene and He's, he's a prior Sydney Kings development player. Yep. He did play as a DP with the Kings and then he pursued the college basketball route. He's actually um, obviously um, dating. He was dating Shyla. So um, that's how that kind of came about. And we just linked up through that common kind of connection. And then, yeah, I guess we just, she was interested in getting a bit of work in and I'm happy to help. So Terrific. Awesome. Yeah, no, good, good, Ash. And I mean, 
great initiative what you're doing with grind over everything and you know it's it's great that you 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 look for that underdog as you mentioned earlier and try to you know up them up and bring them to a level that uh, you know and, and give them opportunities they might not have otherwise had right um you spoke to me offline the other day about grind over everything you said you know it's a mentality you know that we don't really always have in this country like you have in america get in the gym work hard individually one-on-one -on, -one on your game you know when everybody else is out having a beer hanging out with mates get in the gym and put up more shots than the next guy right tell me a little bit about that mentality because i think grind over everything that's what it means as well right so 100 percent, you're spot on the money man i'm gonna man. hire you as a, a brand ambassador man just just i'm a it. sales executive bro you know by, by profession man. That, that's on the money man uh, it stands for a lot of different things man i won't bore you with all of the different pillars and things that i want to kind of tick off with, with what it means to me as a brand but that's definitely up there on the priority list just just working and, and the results that you get from work and ignoring the result and the the, the, just the progress you can make from just outworking the next guy, um, but doing it in a smart way and doing it in a way that you understand, you know, where it's going to be effective and how it's going to be effective and, and just passing on that education and insight to players is, is, is a big part of it. But you're hundred percent right. The culture in this country is like you said, it's after games, it's much more, let's go to the pub and have a beer. Then let's, let's get in the, in the, in the, in the gym and, and work on our game and, and do that and get ready for next game or let's break down some film and look at where we might have gone wrong or where we could be better so just trying to get that any edge you get any kind of one percent you can add on to your chances of being successful i think you need to do especially in a cutthroat industry like like basketball and professional basketball so you know being involved in a brand that i can kind of call it my own is is something that i'm i'm looking forward to building as, as the time goes on brilliant hash love it man and yeah thanks thanks shay you've been a big supporter of the show thanks for sending in your question you're the man um all right guys so let's maybe move on quickly to our to our next segment we just want to touch on the top 75 players i mean i think we're showing our age a little bit robbie i think it was about 50 i was about 15 you was about 18 when the top 50 came out so the last 25 has flown away right i don't know why i get so uh, yeah i was like all week when they were announcing those players i was sort of checking it i was really sort of you know excited about the names and everything so i don't know like at the end of the day we spoke about it it's just you know opinions and lists that have sort of been put together but i guess you know we sort of you know we're sort of very interested in the legacy and all that sort of stuff with the nba there so it, it is sort of important that you know i think they got that right is that sort of how you were feeling as well yeah i think it's a bit silly man what you you in in 78 years time you know you'll have guys like your kids don don Kitch, i think kevin o'connor said that and what do they have to wait another 25 years before they can get on the top 100 mm. it's a bit silly but at the same time it's interesting to talk about it's a nice topic to talk about i know hesh is not a huge fan of this these lists and everything so um yeah hesh, you want to speak on that yeah for sure i mean yeah i'm not a fan of any of these lists like like the, the draft list the draft board the mock drafts the top 10 top five in the league and he's better than him because he shot this many shots and he only averaged this much so he's better than him and the conviction at which some of these analysts and people just say things and they just pretend like it's it's fact is to me just it's a discredit to to how hard and how good these players actually are and how close it actually is in terms of the competition and how gifted we are and privileged we are to actually watch them like we're gonna have 75 guys probably blow that up to 100 150 guys that are arguably the best that have ever played this game you know um, yep. and then to, to argue about this and that I don't know I just I get the I get a little bit irritated over it but like you said it's entertaining to talk about and it's cool to talk about and discuss and as long as it's done with a level of justification and rationale behind it right. I'm cool with it you know as long as it's yeah. as long as it's done in good jest and, and to know we're not we're not hating on certain players or discrediting other players for doing certain things I think word word great great kind of great way to, to get conversation on about the game yeah, I think for for me, Woods, and I know we spoke about this, is I was probably a little bit disappointed they did automatically name the previous 50. I just thought that was – it was almost like I didn't, <clears throat> didn't want to make a hard call there and potentially sort of drop some people out of that there. So, oh, look, I know sort of there's probably, you know, there's a lot of, you know, snubs that we could sort of talk about. Probably the two that I was probably – pretty shocked that they didn't they weren't on that list to be honest were Dwight Howard and Pau Gasol um you know Dwight Howard regardless of what the guy's like off the court and what your opinion is of him I mean what he's done in that center position is you know is incredible and you see guys on that that top 75 list like Robert Parrish and, and things like that and you know they had good careers as well and successful teams but you compare what someone like Parrish did to Dwight Howard and there's no comparison there um I guess in terms of Pau, Pau Gasol he was probably also someone that I thought was a little bit disappointed. I also um, had a couple of guys there. If you can just see them behind me, we've got Vince Carter and uh, Tony Parker. 
Tony Parker's the one I think a lot of people haven't mentioned there. I mean, his resume, yeah. my goodness. Like, I don't know, he seems to have not even sort of made many people snub lists there. So, yeah, they were probably sort of four that I sort of wanted to maybe bring up there. Um, look, it is hard to take these people off. I mean, I was originally pretty um, pretty annoyed that Dominique didn't make the top 50. So, obviously, thrilled yeah. he's now been added to this. And Word. look, I think Definitely, most, people, likewise, will, likewise, most yeah. people will agree it was a bit of an oversight, right, in that initial 50. But yeah. um, what about yourself, Woods? Is there any players that you sort of thought may have, may have made the list? You know, there's one guy, man. You know, nobody scored more points in the 80s. You know, he's a mid-range assassin, Alex English. You'll see me wearing his jersey, one of my favorite jerseys on the show later this season. I just think when you talk about the most underrated plays in the history of the NBA, Alex English has to come up right there. And I think uh, Lee Ellis even mentioned it on No Dunks the other day. Did you hear that, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I think a good comparison is Carmelo, isn't it? I mean, you talk yeah. about some of those scoring guys. I mean, I mentioned you know Bernard King to you as well. You know, obviously Carmelo's yep. made it there. So I guess it's hard to probably differentiate those players there. I mean, maybe Carmelo with his, you know, his college resume and perhaps his international, you know, Olympic resume might have helped him there. But um, was there anyone else, Woods, that sort of came to mind or...? Sidney Moncrief, that's the other guy, you know, one of the greatest defenders, you know, to have ever played the game. Yeah. You know, Michael Jordan even said that, right? You know, he was one of the toughest guys to go up against so him. But, you know, you can get into semantics. We could talk about this for hours. As Hesh said, man, you know, just respect the, the players for what they did. You know, you don't have to put them in a box, right? It's nice to have You reckon Josh, Josh Smith was unlucky not to make it? Or get out of here, man. He's a Josh Smith homer, man. Hesh, <laughs> this guy, right? Like, uh, well, you know. How many Josh Smith jerseys you got? uh 25 or something there you go there you go he's got 25 of one player hash right <laughs> isn't he a homer right that's crazy i, I yeah, don't have i don't i i work professionally full-time in basketball i don't own one jersey yeah, yeah. Jersey. yeah yeah we'll get into that later hash we'll get into that later all right <laughs> mr grind over everything mr basketball all right um let's move on to uh, uh, our next segment and then robbie your favorite segment of the show you know which is hawks talk i was hoping we'd be talking about a, a 4-1 start to the season but disappointing result uh at, at the time of recording we lost today to the wizards so yeah uh, you're right i mean four and one would have been nice to talk about wouldn't it i mean three and two look you know it's, it's probably a decent start to the season we haven't seemed to have played a lot of east teams you know we probably had a few maybe surprising losses you know the Cavs took care of us last week and obviously the wizards today um Look, I think they're sort of coming together okay. I mean, obviously today it was a back-to-back -back for both teams. But, yeah, you're right. Um, you know, we've probably got a, a few people sort of out of form. I was um, looking at Kevin Herter's stats before. My goodness, he's, I think he's shooting 10% from the three-point line and averaging less than five points so far this year. So that's okay. coming from someone that's, you know, a, a double-figure scorer and has normally got a pretty good three-point percentage. So mm -hmm. there's probably people like Herter and probably a few other people that can maybe sort of step it up there. But, um. Yeah, I think we're going okay. No no sort of issues or, or any sort of concerns for me at this stage. What about yourself? Yeah, look, um, maybe I'll just throw over to Hesh that I guess today. I know he's got some hot takes on, on our Atlanta Hawks this year. So, Hesh, yeah, over funny, to you, my man. Funny you mentioned Kevin Herter. I think it might be the extension curse. He just signed recently, didn't he? He did, yep. Yeah, yep. Maybe he's just chilling on his millions at the moment, <laughs> just, you know, thinking about what he's going to do next off season. No, I'm, I'm just joking. He's, he's, I think he's one of the most underrated shooters in the league. Like he can light up and he proved that in, in patches last year that he was, he was big time for the Hawks. Mm -hmm. um, Trey Young for me. Uh, and if you listen to, to me on my other podcast and, or if you know me at all, you know that I'm a huge Trey Young fan. I think he is unbelievable feel for the game and just the way he distributes and, and can get into yeah. pain and do damage. And I love those little guards that, you walking down the street, you wouldn't think he's an NBA superstar. You know, yeah. six one, probably built like me, he's all of seventy kilograms. You know what I mean? And he's There's just nothing of him, is there? Yeah, destroys everyone. Can't guard him. So I, I love Trey Young, and I love his chances for MVP. I think he'll be in the conversation if the Hawks can string together a, a solid season. And obviously, um, I know we're going to talk about it a little bit later, but but the, the big fella, DeAndre Hunt, has been been unreal. Um, and I, I've been, he's been slept on a little bit. I think Atlanta play in a small market, so it's hard to kind of make noise, you know. Uh, but I think if he continues the kind of performance I think he can, I think he's going to be right up there to, to be one of, the, one of the premier kind of defenders and big men in the league. Well, why don't we just talk about DeAndre Hunter right now? I know you, you're big on him for all defensive first team this year, potentially, Robbie. And, mm. um, you know, having him back and fit and two-way player is good for us, right? I absolutely love his versatility in terms of, you know, the defensive end there. I mean, he's, you know, he's already sort of done a pretty good job on Luca this year. He's, he is versatile. He can probably guard, you know, potentially one through to four and potentially if the other team's playing small ball, he could probably potentially guard all positions there. So he's obviously got great length. Um, he's very athletic there, gets in the passing lanes really well. So, yeah, I think definitely that could be something, that, you know, an achievable thing for him to make that all defensive first team or at the very least the second team for this season. 
yeah, a little bit of uh, NBL sort of connection there as well. He's really good friends with Jack Salt, who's the new New Zealand recruit for the Brisbane Bullets. They went to you know college together in Virginia. So a little bit of a connection there with DeAndre Hunter and, and Jack Salt, which is interesting. You know that, Rob? You know all these facts, mate. That's why, that's why I come back each week to the podcast to hear all these you know, <laughs> facts that you have for us. All right. Well, here's one for you, man. JC and All-Star, right? 28 and 12 today, 14 from 16 shooting. You know, the guy, you know, he's, he's got everything to his game. As you said, he's one of the greatest teammates uh, on the Hawks. We talked about Collins the other day. I know your daughter's a big fan as well of JC. So what do you think about his All-Star prospects yeah. this year? I mean, it's year five for JC this year. I mean, I think you're right. I mean, I've sort of just watched what the Hawks look like when they go to timeouts or other stuff like that this year. He is an amazing leader. I mean, he'll go and you know show love to everyone that's sort of been on the court, everyone that's on the bench there. He seems like he's always having fun and kind of enjoying himself. And look, obviously winning does sort of help with that there. But he does seem like he's he stepped up a little bit more this year. He's probably scoring a little bit more than last year. Um, I think definitely he's an all-star um, chance there. I mean, look, if, if Hawks are, you know, having a very good record leading up to the all-star break, yeah. I mean, let's not forget Trey didn't make the all-star game last year, which was, um, I'll save my opinions on that for another day. But um, look, it, it might be that they, they can both make it this year and that, that'd be incredible, right? When was the last time two Hawks made an all-star team? I guess we probably go back to the... The know, four. The four. Yeah. yeah Jeff, yeah, Jeff yeah. Teague all-star, right? Uh, yeah, Jeff Teague, Carl Corver, Carl Corver yeah. as well that year, right? Yeah, the Big so, Al, yeah. 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 So, um, so Hesh, okay, what, just before we move on, Hesh, I know, um, Robbie, you, you had our Hawks at three this year. I had them at four. Uh, what do you think? Home court in the, in the Eastern Conference, Hesh? Or? You'd have to think so, um, yeah. based on their last year's performance. And like, like Robbie just mentioned, JC's proven that he's probably gone up at level um, in terms of, I think, for me, Robbie, it's interesting that you mentioned that. I look for similar things when I watch NBA games. Mm-hmm. His maturity looks like it's come a long way. It just seems like he's a bit more engaged, a bit more locked in. Away from the stat sheet, just looks like he's, he's, he's kind of, I guess, maybe that taste of the playoffs last year and being so close. I think yeah, he is that veteran now, isn't he? I mean, you're looking yeah. at the guys younger than him. You've got Trey and Herder. You've got Cam and, and obviously Hunter there as well. So he's, he's obviously in that leadership role there, but yeah, really enjoying what he's doing. This year. So I agree. I think, yeah, home court advantage is, is definitely. Let's just, what about the East? Who we got? We got obviously Milwaukee, Brooklyn will be Brooklyn, there. Brooklyn, Miami. Miami, yeah. And yeah then that's Sh- what I thought. Chicago, Miami. maybe we got to throw up. Yeah, all right. Yeah, okay, tonight. yeah. You know, I'm wearing the hat today yeah, because yeah. just to shout out, why well, might I well say that the greatest ever start since the 97 Bulls? Yeah. And and what's the, what's the, what's the great stat you told me the other day, bro? Who's first ever four game winning streak in their NBA career? Yeah, Zach Levine. It was unbelievable. He actually did it in the Olympics and got it then. But yeah, this is actually his first ever four game winning streak, which is first yeah, ever yeah, in NBA yeah, history. Yeah. yeah. Right. And he's been in the league for what six, seven years now, yeah, right? That's so that's an amazing stat. Hey man, I keep coming back to the show because you got these stats, man. You know, I don't have these stats. You got these stats, oh, dog. Right. You're doing good, man. All right, all right, all right, cool. Um, and finally, good to see Gallo back, man. You know what I'm saying? Definitely. Yeah, uh, yep, we need right. him out there. Hell yeah. And so, right. right, last thing, Lou Will's arguably probably my one of my favorite players of all time. Preaching of the choir. Skip there. to my Lou, man. Yeah. Skip to my Lou, man. Yeah, Hell yeah. Cool. I love it. I'm the death. Yeah. And um, I think actually quickly, uh, Paddy Mills might take over him this year as the most threes made. Uh, they're on the list, the most threes made off the bench in NBA NBA history. Did you see that list the other day? Yeah, right? well, when Paddy started, he'll do it. But yeah. yeah, so those two are still fighting it out. Yeah, so I mean, yeah. so versatile. He's been in the league since, what, 2006 now, Lou, so mad respect, right? 15 yeah. years. You know, came in came in as a rookie to, to Alan Iverson. On- Alan Iverson, yeah. right. He's got his rookie yeah. Philly yeah. jersey somewhere in the cupboard, too. Yeah. Be surprised yeah so, nah, I love Lou Will and, and everything he's done. And I, I, I don't know if you guys listened to it, but um, he was on, I think it was All the Smoke podcast with Stephen Jackson and Matt Barnes. And he was talking about the six man, the six man kind of label that's been applied to him. And, and he was saying how he'd never really asked for it. It's not like he came into the league being like, I want to be a six man. He wanted to be a starter, just like everyone mm-hmm. else wants to be a starter. But then he just, mm-hmm. it's one of those guys that just gave me the impression that he's, he takes it as it comes and he shows up to work every single day and he's built a hell of a career for himself, man. Uh, he's one of my favorite players. In terms of skill set and demeanor and shot making, he's just someone I love to watch. Yeah, brilliant, Ash. Good shot. All right. Um, I think we'll move on to the NBL uh, part of our, our show today, Robert. I think you're going to take it away and, uh, 
give us a little bit of preview on on the southeast melbourne phoenix today sounds good woods yeah i know we've been looking forward to I mean, obviously these are the the two last teams that we've got for our sort of um previews um look, we'll probably sort of do a little bit of talk maybe about the pre-season once that gets underway but yeah, yeah look i guess sort of you know uh, my team i'm covering this week is the southeast melbourne phoenix um so look, they had a great year last year. They finished in fourth place with a 19 and 17 record. Um, let's not forget that that was only their second season. The first season they were basically second last. So I think it was a pretty good effort last year to sort of get in that top four. I guess just looking at the roster now, and I guess I'll just talk sort of people through that maybe can't see that there. So um, look, they do have a lot of returning players. It's um, that's probably pretty good for them there. In terms of new players there, you know they've obviously got um, Xavier Munford being the new import and Joe Chi, um, the big man out of China, who I'll touch on in a little bit. Um, in terms of a depth chart, you're probably looking at you know Munford and Adam at uh, the point guard spot, um, Glidden and Lee Arthur at the shooting guard position. Uh, Brokoff and Tarangi at the forward spot. And then um, I guess the, the sort of bigger or the sort of guys that are sort of filling out the four and the five positions, you've got Creek, Smith Milner, uh, Joe Chi and da uh, Dane Pinnell, who's obviously going to have a bigger role this year with um, Yanni Wetzel leading. So um, look, the, probably the first one I wanted to speak about was Joe Chi. Um, I think he's, we're definitely sort of looking forward to see how he'll go this year, right, Woods? Um, he's, you know, a f former Houston Rockets draft pick there. He, he's a big talent. Uh, he's a you know he's obviously a very big player with a great outside shot there, so I think he's going to be a very interesting player to have in the NBL this year. I think probably he still might be a little bit slept on. I think obviously the, the people that know a lot about the international game may know about Joe Chi, but I think yeah there'll probably be a few people that'll be sort of pleasantly surprised there. Um, probably one strange thing with this uh, lineup is there's only really the one uh, import at the moment, given that you know we're sort of. Uh, Joe Chi isn't being considered an import, so that's Xavier Munford. He's the one one import. He's the point guard, basically, that's come in to replace um, someone that Hesh mentioned earlier in uh, Kiefer Sykes. So we're looking forward to see how Munford will go. He's got previous NBA experience um, with the Bucks and uh, Memphis. He was also a part of those USA um, select teams that Jeff Van Gundy was coaching that, you know, would sort of go on all the, the yep. qualifying games and everything else like that. So, look, he's got a pretty good pedigree. Um, he played in Turkey last year. Um, I did have a laugh when I saw the team name he played for. They were called the Fruity Extra Burispor. So, yeah, obviously Fruity Extra was their sponsor there. So I thought that was pretty good, that one. But, yeah, we're looking forward to see how, um, obviously, Xavier Munford will go there. Um, I did touch on Kyle Adnan um, previously. And, look, he had a, a great season last year. He sort of seemed to fill any role that he could sort of do there with sort of injuries and everything like that. Um, now, Hesh, I know you've had Adnan on your show recently there, mate. Um, how do you sort of see him coming uh, going for this upcoming season? Yeah, we, we actually interviewed him two nights ago. I think that episode dropping tonight, hopefully, if all goes well. So keep your eyes peeled for that one. But yeah, Adnan was, um, he was he was great to chat to. And, and I think he's going to, like you said, he had a good season last year. He, um, he came up big in the, in the, in during the regular season when Keeper Sykes was out for a bit. He kind of stamped his authority on really being a, a, a good point guard in the NBL. And then um, he, he, he even talked about it, his contributions in the finals and, and the, Obviously, the playoffs weren't as much as he would have liked, and he felt like he was—he's happy to take that role because Keeper Sykes is obviously wild and out. He was having mm. a hell of a hell of a series, but I think a, a big year from Adam, who's been appointed the captain as well, I believe. So he's kind of taken on yes, that leadership yes. role, and yeah. yeah, I think he's gonna have a big year. And he, he's pretty confident with their chances. He said everyone's in a good frame of mind. He thinks it, it was funny. We spoke about Coach Simon Mitchell. Um, what well, Adam was mentioning, I asked him about. I read something about how Simon Mitchell was gonna play that game three as motivation for, for this year's lineup, just to take them back to that point of how close they were to actually getting to the NBL finals. And um, he said he hasn't done that yet, but he's saving it for later in the preseason. So I think they're in a good space and, and how they're kind of, how they've processed last year and how they're going to turn it into motivation this year is going to be good. And Adam's going to be a big part, part of that, I think. No, look, I definitely tend to agree with you there, Hesh. I mean, look, we have sort of looked at a lot of these rosters um, each week, Woods, and we've sort of commented that yep. you know, just how strong the league's going to be. But look, I do like this roster. Obviously, you've got some really good Australian talent there. I mean, guys like, you know, Mitch Creek, obviously, you know, Cam Glidden, Dane Pinnell. We've got the three Kiwis on the roster as well. Um, and so, look, I mean, I think there is one sort of spot vacant now. So it'd be interesting to see if they do decide to fill that there. But uh, I think hey, they're going hey, to be just one thing, Robbie, you know, Ryan broke off. He looked a shell of the player we've seen on international level and throughout his professional career. You know, last year he was, he had an off year in, in, in the league. He was suffering from, from some mental health problems, which has been well documented. You know, he, he sat out of the Olympics. 
uh, this year he's had time to rest and re- recuperate, and we're going to see. Are we going to see the best out of him in Australia for the first time this season? Yeah, Woods. I definitely think we will. I think. I mean, obviously, last year was a, a pretty sort of interrupted season. He probably wasn't expecting it to go how it did with Dallas and sort of ending you know, yep. back up in Australia, sort of True. thing. And he probably, as much as he sort of came with the NBL sort of NBA preseason under his belt, he, he hadn't sort of adjusted to you know, what the, the, the Phoenix was sort of doing and their sort of lineup and everything. So, look, he did show a few signs. I think we all remember that game he had um, against the Illawarra last season, late in the season, where he just got really hot. I think he sort of showed a few things with that game that he's he is an amazing shooter there. So I, I am expecting a lot, a bit of a bounce back season from him there. And look, let's hope, obviously, you know, you mentioned the mental health and obviously everything else like that's going well for him now. But I, I'm really hoping he'll, he'll have a big year for, for the Phoenix this season, for sure. Thanks, Rob. Like, look, before we move on, why don't you give us your fantasy stud and sleeper like we do for, for all the teams, you know? And sure. tell us what you think there, right? Yep. So, look, I found that probably maybe a little bit sort of harder sort of working that out with some of these sort of players there in terms of, um, you know, the sleeper and the stud and everything else like that. Um, look, I'm going to say Mitch Creek for the stud. I mean, if anyone had him in their fantasy team last year, he was an absolute stud. He sort of fills it up all across the board. Yep. In terms of the sleeper, probably a strange one, given we've just talked about how important he'll be. But I'm going to say Joe Chi, just at this stage now. So, look, if you are going to be playing fantasy, he, he may be a little bit cheaper to start off the season, but I don't expect that to stay that way. So, look, he may be a very early season sleeper, but I don't think that'll sort of continue anyway. So, yeah, that'd be my, my fantasy start and sleeper there. So, yeah. Um, and so I believe, Woods, you're going to uh, take us through the Melbourne United sort of preview now. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, and, and thanks for that, Robbie. Really good there, um, summation there. So look, the thing with Melbourne I noticed straight away is like you got Hobson, Barber, Landale, McCarran and McDaniel all gone. You know, five players that were crit- critical of the championship run last year, right? And you know, if you're looking at th- this roster right now, you've got a lot of new players coming in and, and uh, they're, they're starting fresh. You know, the only people that are staying are Chris Golding, Jack White's obviously probably going to be out for the rest of the season. I don't know if he's going to play. Do you have any intel there, Hesh, on Jack White? Is he going to be back by the, before the end of the season? I believe so. I think he, he's gone well with his uh, his injury. Um, yep. He posted something the other day, and I heard from somebody that kind of knows him that said that he's he's kind of looking forward to have, being better and, and stronger than he was pre-injury. So I think I think Jack White's going to, going to come back and, and be a, a huge piece of, of United. Yeah. Well, that'd be good. He was leading the league in blocks at one six six or whatever yeah. for a while last year. So it'll be good to to have him back. He's got a lot of upside. Um, you got Mason Peatling, Shilly, who I love, you know, Rob, Joe Luol, never seen a shot I don't like, a chul back, and and David Barlow, the veteran, right? So just go through the depth chart for the people who can't see. We got Delhi Goulding, uh, Caleb Bagada, the, the Nigerian Canadian, Mason Peatling, and Joe Luol a chul um, slated to start and off the bench. You got Shea Ely. Dion Prouster, who we'll touch on a little bit later, the veteran Brad Newley, David Barlow, the veteran, um, and the next star, uh, Huck Porty from Germany, who, who I'll touch on. So, look, let me just quickly go through, um, you know, some of these players and, and tell you a little bit about what I think. I mean, let, let me kick off about with speaking about Delhi, right, and what he's going to bring to the team. Now, he brings that experience and leadership, and he's definitely uh, still a great game manager. However, he struggled with his health over the last few years, guys. Ever since he changed that shot, his shooting numbers have been abysmal. Uh, he stated he wants to use this season as a springboard to get back to the NBA. Uh, for me, that seems like a stretch. What do you guys think? Yeah, absolute stretch, I reckon. I think he was probably sort of you know, barely hanging on for those last couple of seasons. And he's, he's obviously, you know, he's getting older now. I think the NBL is probably the best place for him. Um, look, we talked about the, the shooting there. Woods potentially having that close to three-point line could be something that maybe helps Delhi a little bit as well. Yep. He obviously wasn't someone that had a lot of range there, but... Look, it's going to be obviously good to have a player of his, you know, status um, in the NBL now. But I think for people that sort of expect him to come in and sort of, you know, even sort of be playing like he was, you know, on those Cavs teams a few years ago, might be a little bit disappointed, to be honest. And Hesh, do you think that um, Delhi is an upgrade or a downgrade on money-making Mitch McCarron? I don't know whether this is a popular or an unpopular take. I'm going to say downgrade overall. Yeah, let I agree. Just, let me just justify very quickly. Um, yep. I think... Delhi will bring a lot in terms of off-court abilities and professional yeah. and, and his experience. Obviously, you can't take that for granted and you can't underestimate that. But Mitch McCarron, for me, is arguably the most underrated point guard in, in the competition. Yeah. He's He was special. And the crazy thing about what Mitch McCarron was doing last year, I thought, was he would have the ball in his hands in crunch time to be yeah. the main decision-maker with guys like Goulding, Landale, um, big Australian guys that play for the Boomers and an NBA 
kind of obviously Lando's doing damage in the NBA now, but it's and they all trust right. Mitch McCarron and he's making great decisions with ball in his hands playing the one. So I think it's a downgrade personally, just based on what Robbie also mentioned about Dewey and, and where he's at currently. So uh, you know, that's my take. I don't know if that'll be regarded or agreed with, but what do you think? I think we both agree with you there. Um yeah, and yeah, you know, I know I know your brother Robbie also told Matt Clayton told me said, said make sure Woody speaks about Caleb Agada on the show this week. So so for sure, Matt, you know, uh, I've done my research on Caleb, and obviously he has that dual Nigerian Canadian citizenship, as I mentioned earlier. So we have another Canadian import in the league, Robbie, like this year. That's three, you know. So um, up, yeah, they, they're going up. So Caleb Agada, we saw him in Nigeria in the Olympics. We saw him in Vegas in the practice games against the USA when Nigeria won. Uh, he was fearless, and he took it to Team USA. He's just a solid all-round player, very good at getting to the rim. He doesn't have elite ball handling or any you know go-to moves, but he can somehow get by defenders and get to the rack. Um, he'll adapt well to the way the game is called here. He's a, he's tough as nails, you know. And uh, as I said earlier, you know he's he's, he's an all-round player. He can do a bit of everything on the basketball court. We'll see some highlight real plays from this year. He's an athlete think, for sure, isn't he, Woods? Yeah, and you know he'll be a role-playing import. On this team, I've got him here uh, as a starting, uh, you know, three man. But I wouldn't be surprised if good old Vickerman throws uh, Brad Newley or even Barlow into the three spot to start and brings him off the bench like Scotty Upson. Hope he doesn't, but um, I have a feeling he may. You know, um, be wary as an import playing under Vickerman, right? Yeah, that's true. And look, I know we sort of touched base on this before. Woods, not quite sure about this roster, mate. I, yeah. I mean, I, I've always, probably for the last two seasons, I thought United probably had the deepest roster there. You know, if it was being played on paper, they would have won. You know, the last two seasons. But I just look at this team now, and there seems to be a few holes there. There's, yeah, not quite sure with ways on. You know, the other teams have sort of improved how they'll actually go this year. Yeah. I think the top yeah. four could could be a stretch for them this year. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And and hey, you were going to have Caleb Bagard on your show recently, but it fell through, right? Yeah, that's right. We we lined it up and we picked a date and a time, and he was all good for it. And then just before kind of launch, he said, "Oh, he's probably not advised best from his team not to chat right now before the season or whatever." So you know, I've uh, got to respect those those wishes and understand that that's what his that's what his camp has told him to do. Um, yep. But yeah, he's someone that I think is is pretty pretty special. Obviously, he showed himself and made a name for himself. Um, playing for Nigeria uh, in the Olympics, and he was took a ride to Team USA. What's his NBA experience like? I don't think he's had any any NBA experiences yet. He's played in summer league, I think. That's it, right? Okay. No, I don't think he's yeah. he's had any full NBA experience as yet. But um, he's played in Europe and been very successful over there. Played in the Canadian league, I think, Robbie, a little bit, right? Yeah, so, I think so. Yeah. Um, yeah, but he's got that international experience, you know, which 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 doesn't hurt, right? Going to the Olympics and. Um, taking taking on some of the best uh, players in the world, so let, let's see how he goes, and he might fit into that Melbourne si- system well, like uh, Scotty Hobson did last year under Vickerman. It, it's a wait and see. Um, and the other guy was um, Huck Porty, Gabriel Huck Porty. He was born in Germany. He's a he's a next star. He, you know, he's Togolese, but he's he, he was born in Germany. He grew up playing football as a defender. He took up basketball at the age of eleven. Uh, I think it was a great de- decision because the guy is a physical specimen with ridiculous athleticism and athleticism and NBA ability. You know, there's comparisons being made with him and Thomas Bryant from the Wizards. Uh, his movement and skills are really good for a guy nearly seven seven feet, one fifteen kilos. Um, his ability to get off the ground and his size is impressive. He's a good shot blocker. And, you know, most of his points are scored around the rim with layups and dunks. Um, I guess he's projected to be a late second round pick, Robbie and, and Hesh, and or even undrafted. So, like other next stars that have come here and and risen their stocks, a good season could could see 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 that draft position improving and and improve his chances of uh, getting drafted next year. Um, hey, yeah. Woods on that as well. I know we sort of or you know do sort of have that constant battle with some of our mates, you know, to to sort of support and watch the NBL. I mean, there's so many sort of guys in this year's league that you know are potentially going to get drafted. We've seen obviously Giddy so far. We've seen Lamelo Ball sort of thing. So we yep. just encourage people just to, to to support and watch our local game there, and you know look out for some of these guys yeah. before you know because they might only been here one season, and then they're going to be playing in the big league next year. So yeah. I just thought I'd throw that out anyway. Yeah, I mean Hesh, Hesh will also attest to that, Robbie. We need we need like all those. People people who are oh, through the NBL, we're just NBA guys. They're 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 ignorant, right, Hesh? You know, like hundred percent. And hey, guilty as charged. I have I've suffered from that at times. You know, before I got involved in the actual space and firsthand and, and being there, I, I used to be, you know, a bit of a sheep and just think, oh yeah, the NBA is better, NBL's not even that good. But then you look at the talent and at all any time you're talking about a professional level. And these guys do yep. this for a living. You have to respect the work that they put in and, and what they 
what they leave out there for us to watch as fans. So I, I encourage everybody to get behind the NBL and and you know do do it do it justice because it's it's a great league with great talent. And like Robbie said, a lot of these guys are going to be onto bigger and better things. And to know that you were you were courtside there watching someone or interacted with someone like that is it, kind of cool to think about. Absolutely, yeah. Well said, Hesh. And um, you're a perfect example of that, right? So terrific. Uh, look, my boy Jaden Oakley, who covers the NBA on TikTok, we're going to actually have him on the show pretty soon. Um, love what he's doing and, and getting the game out there on on, on that channel. Um, he's very, very good friends with Dave Oakey. And he, he told me he's he's heard all about Coach Hesh from Dave, right? So Hesh, tell us a little bit about Dave Oakey. You know, we got him listed there as, as the development player who's recently been signed by Melbourne United. So give us a little bit of insight onto Dave, Dave Oakey. Dave O'Hickey, my guy Dave, he is dude, one of the most talented basketball players I've, I've ever seen. Um, and if you see him firsthand, close up, and even even tougher if you see him face to face, squaring up with him, standing in front of him, but he, he moves like an absolute, I don't know, specimen. He's just 6'3", 6'4", wiry, strong, great leaping ability, takes off from anywhere and tries to dunk on people. His skill set and change of speed is second to none, great shot maker skilled ultimately skilled and can and can score the ball i think he's probably arguably one of the most skilled development players in the country i read yep. an article the other day looking out for five dps and, and david aquero who's another development player from melbourne is on that list uh, along with a few others but david hickey is definitely someone to look out for i think he will given the right opportunity he'll cement himself in the in the nbl i think it's just a matter of opportunity for guys like that he has to be in the right situation and have a coach at, you know those those type of players that need the empowerment and the encouragement to go out and play their games. They just they have a talent and they can't be capped kept in a cage. So I hope Davo gets that opportunity at Melbourne and he cements himself. Um, so let's see. Absolutely, and he's been on the receiving end of a few alley passes from yourself, right? Yeah, I remember playing pickup with him at, at KGV. You know the courts in, in Sydney. Yep, I do. Yeah, I do. We used to I do. Be there Friday night, and every time on the break, I yeah just toss it up anywhere anywhere near the side of the backboard, and Davo will go and get it for sure. Super athlete. And Rob, Robbie, um, I, I know Mahesh just in, uh, mentioned David Aquaria. He's, he's from your neck of the woods, right? Yeah, definitely. So, he's, yeah, I believe he sort of started off, um, he grew up in Perth before sort of moving to Melbourne recently. So, I don't know. I, I guess there is some young talent on this team, Woods. Maybe we are sort of, I guess, maybe sleeping on them a little bit. But, yeah, we'll see how we go yeah. with that, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, and just a quick shout-out to Dion Prusa on the uh, on the back of being named New Zealand NBL MVP, Defensive Player of the Year. He gets another shot at the NBL at the age of 31. And being part of that Sydney Kings alumni, I'm really happy to see him get this opportunity late in life. It just shows that hard, we, hard work uh, always pays off and to never give up. Uh, Mahesh, uh, I know you know you know him, Dion, as well, right? So, yeah, like I, I, don't, I don't know him personally at all, but I've interacted with him a little bit, played on his yeah. team for a couple of, games in a tournament when he was based in sydney he he's he's tight with a couple of guys that I've, I've worked with in the basketball space so i got a chance to play with him and i was super impressed with his game really hard work a defensive monster he, yep. he does a lot um and he does all the little things really well very one of those guys that does all the intangibles and you tell him to do something he'll get it done he's one of those kind of workhorses so I, I i like i like the fact that he's back in the nbl i know he floated around the cusp for a little while yeah um, and i'm excited to watch him play Terrific. Thanks, Hesh. And look, just before we move on to my stud and sleeper, Robbie, I just thought I'd ask you about the two veterans together on the mm. team together. I mean, Barlow and Newley. I mean, uh, this, this, they've been in the league. Uh, they've been in the, you know, part of uh, the Australian basketball program for, you know, nearly two decades now, both of them. They're coming to the very end of it. And it's a nice touch to have them together this season, probably maybe their last season, right? Yeah, I think so too, mate. Look, I've probably brought the average age up for, for United by quite a lot with these two guys. But yeah, I think <laughs> right. it's important to have those guys on the team. I mean, you, uh, uh, Arlo definitely showed, had some moments last year. You know, he can definitely come on and just hit yep. those threes he's been hitting throughout his career. I'm not probably as high on Newley maybe as, as, you know, as maybe others might be. I just think his sort of style has slowed down a little bit now. But I think just having that veteran presence around the locker room, you know, he's a good teammate and everything. So I think, yeah, it probably could be a swan song for those two. But, yeah, it'd be, be good to have those two and, veterans on the and, team. And you mentioned the young talent off the court, right, is where they're going to help these guys. Exactly like, you right. Know, That's where they're going to be. Picky and money, Aquera right? and, and, you know, a 40, et cetera, right? So. For sure. Terrific. And what about those uh, the fantasy sort of um, outlook for this year, Woods? Have you got a, a start and a sleeper for us for Melbourne? I know the three of us caught up yesterday and, you know, Hesh isn't much of a fantasy player saying, you know, no, no, go with CG43. You know he ain't a fantasy player in the NBL, right? So, you know, I, I was thinking about it over overnight and I thought, um, 
Look, I'm going to go with Caleb Agada because just I was looking up his stats in other leagues around the world and he gets those steal numbers, block numbers. Um, you know, he shoots at a decent percentage. So I'm going to go with Caleb Agada. You'll get, you don't, it's hard to get a good small forward in fantasy. You might get him at that 1K price to start off with and mm-hmm. that price might build. So I'm going to go with Caleb Agada uh, as, the, as the stud. Uh, and as a sleeper, I'm going to go with Dion Prewster. You know, looking at his NZBL stats last year, um, terrific. Also getting those defensive stats. You might get him at a really cheap basement price. So it's really tough. You know, there's other, there's Delhi you can look at, Joe Luala Chul. But for me, I'm going to go with Kayla Bagada as the as the start and Dion Prewster as the sleeper. All right. Um, so that, you know, that sort of brings us to the end here, guys. So I just wanted to go through a few things. Uh, a, a correction from last week myself. Uh, I was talking about how good it was for uh, Josh Giddy and Trey Mann to have, um, uh, you know, experienced teammates um, on, on their uh, on that roster to help them along. I, I said Trey Mann. Um, I said Terrence Mann when I should have said Trey Mann. So I, I apologize about that. Um, uh, so yep. That's that. I know that mistake's been made a few times. So just easy time, mate. Easy time. No worries. Um, yeah. So thanks for tuning in. You know, please subscribe to us if you like the show. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, any medium that you want to listen to the podcast, please do so or check out Throwback Hoops. That's our YouTube channel. Uh, Robbie, where can we be followed uh, on Twitter? Yeah, for sure. So we are at, at Throwbacks Hoops on Twitter. So as we mentioned last week, we have been stepping up, you know, sort of the tweets and the content that's going on there. Um, we also put, you know, um, details of all, you know, pictures of the jerseys that we wear each week, which I know a lot of people are enjoying seeing. So yeah, continue to sort of, uh, I guess, like and subscribe us on Twitter. Uh, what about our email address, Woods? Where can people send um, uh, questions to us? Yep. So it'll be um, Throwback Hoops Podcast at gmail.com. Um, please keep sending in the questions. We really appreciate it. Um, my TikTok channel is Woody underscore V83. If you want to follow me there, that's great. Um, terrific. Uh, thanks, Coach Hesh. Um, you enjoy yourself today, man? Definitely, man. Love chopping up with you guys. And like I said, love what, love what you guys are doing, man. It's a, it's, a cool re- it's a cool look with the retro jerseys and everything you guys have. Probably access to a, a wardrobe of jerseys that I, I would say arguably the best in the country. Oh yeah, no doubt, Robbie. Yeah, right, we've been doubt. thinking about that for years, haven't we? We might have the, one of yeah. the biggest collections. But yeah, well, it's good to showcase all that. And like I said, it's been, it's been a pleasure to be here. Enjoyed myself. And Hesh, look, where can the audience follow you? Yeah, for sure. So obviously, um, my my own personal brand is grind dot over dot everything on Instagram, and um, the podcast stuff that I'm doing and some of the other content I'm doing in the media space is is that Oz Hoopers TV on Instagram as well. So, um, yeah, if, you, if you're interested in any of that, you know, chuck on it and give us a follow. Yeah, definitely, Hesh. Th- thanks for that. We hope to have you on the show again later on this season as well. Absolutely. It's been really fun, right? So, um, look, I guess, Robbie, man, what's going on with that moustache? I know my goatee's getting a bit long and stuff, man, but I thought you were going to get rid of that. November Mo- Mo- means you got to shave it at the start of the month, man. You can't cheat like this. Yeah, I might do All like right. a reverse Movember and maybe I'll like, you know, donate some money to the Movember yeah. cause and actually shave it off. So we'll see how we go though, mate. Let's Is see. your wife even kissing you at the moment? Or? No, not coming anywhere near me. <laughs> and, and uh, man, Hesh, bro, you know, as I said earlier, grind over everything, Mr. Basketball does not even own a basketball jersey. So this is, this is, uh, this is what I got, right? Robbie, you know, we got to thank Hesh for being on the show, right? And I know you both got a man crush on Luke Travis. So what you're going to do is gonna get, you're going to get on uh, Perth Wildcats NBL store and you're going to order a, a set. In fact, I'll pay for them. I'll say I'll pay for them, man. You know, you just order them, right? And we're going to get Hesh and yourself a Luke Travis jersey to add to your collections. How does that sound, right? Let's do Happy it. Rock, rock that Travis number 20, 23 jersey. I like the sound of that. Yeah, and I like to see both of you wearing it. Yeah, both of us will wear it, and then you guys, you'll be the one asking for a Travis jersey when he makes the league next year. (laughs) Yeah, all right, all right. Well, it's been awesome, man. So much fun today. Uh, You guys are awesome. Uh, We look forward to seeing you all next week. Any any final thoughts, Rob or Hesh? I just wanted to, yeah, just obviously thank Hesh as well. It's been sort of great having his insight and having him on the show. And, yeah, I can't wait to do it all again next week as well, Woods. Much love, boys. Much yeah, love. Guys, thank you, guys. Peace out. Peace. Peace.